Here's a super simple addition problem. Even if you change the order of the numbers, the result stays the same. Sounds obvious? Yeah, maybe. But what if we deal with infinity? When we add infinitely many terms, if we change their order, something really strange can happen. I first realized that when... Zundam on wake up. Uh, are you alright? Looks like today's problem is about infinite series. We absolutely have to solve it. Oh right, I remember now. Though I'm not exactly sure why. An infinite sum is called an infinite series or just a series. This is one of the most famous examples of a series, known as the harmonic series. It seems to be the key to solving today's problem. If you keep summing the reciprocals of natural numbers infinitely, even though the terms keep getting smaller, it's known that the sum diverges to infinity. Oh, you do get it. Then how about this? Hmm, this is... It looks similar to the harmonic series, but the signs of the terms alternate. Exactly. This is called the alternating harmonic series. And its sum is actually known to be the natural log of 2. What? The harmonic series diverges to infinity, but the alternating harmonic series has a finite value. And that result is the natural log of 2. That's kind of cool. You're not done being surprised yet. Next, let's consider a series like this. Uh, it looks similar to the alternating harmonic series, but I can't see the pattern. It's a bit tricky, but what if we separate the positive and negative terms like this? Hmm, I see. In the alternating harmonic series, positive and negative terms appeared alternately. But this time, two negative terms follow each positive term. Good observation. Now what do you think the sum of this series will be? Huh, Mitten, that's obvious. This series is just a rearrangement of the original series. So of course the result must be the same. I thought so at first too. But the result turns out like this. Really? Something quite strange is happening here. Intuitively, since more negative terms appear earlier, the result ends up being a bit smaller. That explanation isn't entirely unreasonable, but... I feel like I've been tricked. Did we really just change the order of the terms? I can understand why that feels unsettling. Let's think more about that later. Got it. Now let's express the alternating harmonic series using sigma notation. First, since the denominator increases by 1 each time, we can represent it with n and the alternating signs can be expressed as negative 1 to the n minus 1? That makes sense. And we know this sum converges to the natural log of 2, right? Furthermore, if we take the absolute value of each term, the factor negative 1 to the n minus 1 disappears, leaving just the reciprocals of natural numbers, which means we're left with the harmonic series, and we know that it diverges to infinity. I see. So taking the absolute value makes it diverge. I feel like I'm starting to grasp the key idea. This strange property of the alternating harmonic series is called conditional convergence. Next, let's properly define conditional convergence. First, we will review the definition of convergence. Before considering the sum of infinitely many terms, let's first look at the sum up to a certain term, called the partial sum. If we let the number of terms in this partial sum approach infinity, and if the sum converges to a finite value we say that the series converges, we then consider this limit value alpha as the sum of infinitely many terms. Well I already knew that. Next, let's consider the series formed by taking the absolute value of each term. If this series converges to a finite value, we say that the original series is absolutely convergent. How is this different from the previous definition of convergence? Absolute convergence is a stricter condition than usual convergence. The alternating harmonic series we saw earlier was convergent, but it was not absolutely convergent. It is known that if a series is absolutely convergent, then it is also convergent in the usual sense, but the converse is not necessarily true. Yeah, that's exactly what happened in the previous example. In ordinary convergence, positive and negative terms can cancel each other out, but absolute convergence doesn't allow for that kind of cancellation. That's a reasonable way to think about it. As in the case of the alternating harmonic series, when a series converges but does not converge absolutely, it is said to converge conditionally. The original series converges to a finite value alpha, but if you take the absolute values of the terms, the series diverges to infinity. You're right. Oh, watch out, a problem is coming. What? What's going on?
on? Uh, remand rearrangement theorem? So we need to prove this theorem? Let's say we have a conditionally convergent series and a real number beta. Originally, the series converges to alpha, but if we rearrange the terms, the resulting series can converge to beta. Ah, uh, so in other words, a conditionally convergent series can be rearranged to converge to any real number. That's what it means. What a terrifying theorem. Just by changing the order of addition, we can control the result whatever we want. If someone with ill intentions used this, it could be disastrous. I don't think that's likely. But that's not even the most shocking part. Apparently, if you rearrange the terms cleverly, you can even make the series diverge. How do you even know that? Ah, that means... For example, a conditionally convergent series that originally converges to zero can be rearranged to diverge to infinity. I, I can't believe it. But we can't just stand here doing nothing. All right then, Professor Matten, please start the proof. Zundemann, you'll be helping too, you know. But before that, let's first properly define what we mean by rearrangement. Well, even if we manage to prove it, if we don't clarify this first, it might feel like we're just being tricked. All right, then please explain. Very well. Let's consider a series like this. Now, let's rearrange the terms of this series to create a new series. In this rearranged series, each term from the original series must appear exactly once somewhere. This kind of operation is what we call a rearrangement of a series. So that's how we define it. By the way, what if the original series has the same value appearing multiple times? Sure question. Here, even if multiple terms have the same value, we consider them as separate terms, as long as their indices are different. So in other words, essentially, we're just rearranging a sequence of natural numbers. It is a sequence where each natural number appears exactly once somewhere. That's the essence of what we're doing here. I see, so that's how it works. If you ever get confused about what it means to rearrange infinitely many terms, just go back to this definition, and you won't lose your way. It's reassuring to have a place to return to. Alright, let's start proving this theorem. Zundemann, do you have any ideas? Um, it's hard to come up with something on the spot. But, I feel like the example we saw earlier might be useful. The alternating harmonic series is conditionally convergent, right? And if we rearrange the series, the sum changes. In fact, in the rearranged series, each term from the original series appears exactly once somewhere. So this follows the rule of rearrangement we defined earlier? Yes, that sounds good. In this rearrangement, we separate the series into positive and negative terms, then adjust the amount taken from each, changing the sum's limit. Could we apply the same idea here? That's a great idea. Now let's consider the general case. We will arrange the terms of a sequence an like this, and separate the positive and negative terms. For example, suppose the terms have signs like this. We define a n plus as the sequence of the positive terms, and a n minus as the sequence of the negative terms. If we assign zero to the positive side, we've split the original sequence perfectly into these two sequences. Furthermore, let's assume that the series formed by summing a n is conditionally convergent. That means it converges in the usual sense, but diverges when taking the absolute values of the terms. Now what happens in this case? Uh, I don't know what to say. Then let's look at what happens when summing a n plus, and also when summing a n minus separately. Hmm, a n plus is the sequence of the positive terms, and a n minus is the sequence of the negative terms, right? If we assume both sums are finite, then the sum of absolute values would also converge to a finite value, which contradicts the definition of conditional convergence. Yes, you're on the right track. To put it more precisely, first we will take another look at these three sequences. A n plus and A n minus each have missing parts, so their nth terms are not aligned with A n. To fix this, let's temporarily fill the missing parts with zeros. That way the indices of A n, A n plus and A n minus will properly align. Oh, that makes sense. Now going back to our situation, keeping in mind that their indices now match, we see that the absolute value of an equals an plus minus an minus holds. That's because if an is positive, only an plus remains, and if an is negative, only an minus remains. 
Note that since an minus is negative, taking its absolute value as a negative sign? Hmm, I see, so then... What this equation tells us is, if we assume both of these series converge to finite values, then we can express the sum of the absolute values of an as the difference of the two series. That would mean this series also converges, but this contradicts our assumption of conditional convergence, so at least one of these sums must diverge. Oh, I get it now. And if one of them diverges, in order for the series to still converge in the usual sense, the other sum must diverge in the opposite way. The positive infinity must be cancelled out by negative infinity, otherwise the sum won't be finite. Let's confirm one more thing. If a series converges in the usual sense, then an must tend to zero. Thus, both an plus and an minus must also tend to zero. Oh, you're right. Here the fact that each sum diverges means that there must be infinitely many positive and negative terms. That makes sense. Now we're starting to see the whole picture. Within this series, there's a sum that diverges to positive infinity, and another that diverges to negative infinity. While each term tends to zero, that's the key point. It looks like you've got it. Alright, let's finish this. Okay. Ah, uh, so let's rearrange this series so that it converges here. As we can see from this equation, we can move either toward the positive or the negative side as much as we want. Alright, let's start by summing the positive terms. This is the way to do it. And once we go above the boundary, we stop. Next, we add the negative terms. When we go below the boundary, we stop again. Then we add more positive terms. By repeating this process, since both positive and negative terms tend to zero, we keep getting closer and closer to the boundary. Brilliant! Since each term of the original series is used exactly once somewhere, we are indeed able to make the series converge to any desired value by rearranging it. Hmm, even though I did it myself, I still feel like something is off. But it's definitely a rearrangement. Now we need a way to make it diverge. Oh right! Uh, how do we do that? If we just keep adding positive terms, it should diverge to positive infinity. That's true. But in that case we wouldn't be including the negative terms, so it wouldn't count as a proper rearrangement of the series. Oh no, I totally forgot. Actually we can make it diverge to infinity using the same idea. Really? First we proceed with the first iteration as before. That makes sense so far. Then on the next iteration we go above a higher boundary. Repeating this process, we can keep increasing the value infinitely. In this way we're still using the negative terms properly. So this counts as a rearrangement. This method makes the series diverge to positive infinity. And we can use the same strategy to make it diverge to negative infinity. Another important case to consider is oscillation. The basic idea is the same. First we go above the boundary as before. Next we go below a lower boundary. Then we go above the original boundary again. This creates an oscillating pattern. It doesn't converge anywhere, but it also doesn't diverge to positive or negative infinity. Wow! Uh, just by adjusting the boundary, we can create different behaviors. Anyway, we've now proven Riemann Rearrangement Theorem. It was more of an intuitive explanation rather than a rigorous proof, though. Conditionally convergent series can be rearranged to manipulate their sums at will. The reason why we are told to be careful with the order of summation in infinite series is exactly because of this. Even so, was this really okay? It feels a bit unsettling that simply changing the order of addition alters the result. I understand how you feel, but you can also think of it this way. Conditional convergence is an unstable balance between positive and negative infinity. Two infinite forces were maintaining a balance to make it converge to a finite value. Once that balance was disturbed, something very strange happened. Ah, uh, so in other words, infinity is a truly mysterious world. Did you really understand that? By the way, while strange things happen with conditional convergence, it is known that absolutely convergent series remain unchanged even if rearranged. That means we can add them without any worries. Absolute convergence is a really important property. In a way, it allows us to treat infinite sums the same way as finite sums. So we can say that absolute convergence is a nice property. Please be very careful about the order of addition. Well then, take care everyone. 
See you later.